Bible with you. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, if you don't know, that is the resurrection chapter. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to be starting in verse 12. And we're going to be looking at the question of, what does it really matter that Jesus was raised from the dead? We say he is risen indeed, but so what? And I don't mean to be uh, frivolous when I say that, or offensive, because it really does matter, but the question is, why does it really matter? Why does it really matter that Jesus was raised from the dead? Physically, literally, in history, in reality, it's not just sort of that he was raised spiritually, or that it's a nice idea, and it's something that we kind of talk about once a month, but if Jesus Christ wasn't physically, literally, historically raised from the dead in reality, the Bible itself tells us that we're wasting our time. We shouldn't be here on Sunday morning. We should be sleeping in. We should be watching football, or like I like actual football, like soccer. That's what I call it. <laughs> you guys can watch like American football or whatever. If Christ was not raised from the dead, our faith is useless, futile, and we shouldn't even be here. We've been going through the book of Acts over the last few months, and it may seem obvious, but I think it deserves special attention today, that Acts is, is, is preceded by a pretty significant event in history. There would be no book of Acts, there would be no early church, there would be no believers waiting in God on prayer if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead. If there was no physical, literal, historical resurrection of Jesus the Christ from the dead, then there's no book of Acts, there's no early church, we wouldn't be here this morning, and if we were here this morning, we would get to chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, and we'd all go home. Because Paul is telling us, the Apostle Paul is telling us in 1 Corinthians that if Jesus hasn't physically, literally been raised from dead as a from the dead as a real event in history, then there's, there's no point in us being here. So let's uh, read in 1 Corinthians 15. We'll start in verse 12. First Corinthians 15, starting verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Oh, that would be a great Sunday morning. <laughs> if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So those who have died believing in Christ, there's no eternal hope for them if Christ has not been raised. If in Christ, verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So right, right, right in the beginning of Paul's message, when he's writing to the Corinthians, he's saying, if Jesus hasn't physically, really, literally been raised from the dead, then we're wasting our time. There's no point in Christianity if that didn't actually happen. And what makes it true isn't the fact that a whole bunch of people believe it. You can't say, oh, well, there's a billion Christians in the world that must be right. Well, not at all. If it didn't physically, literally happen, then there's no point in it. Um, some of you may know that I work with youth. And a youth said to me one time, a youth group, he's, he's not a Christian. He's like, you know, questioning, atheist, agnostic, which is great. It's fine. And so he said, well, would you be a Christian if Jesus Christ wasn't raised from the dead? And he said, if I could produce the body of Jesus... And, he's, and I was like, well, it'd be hard to prove, you know, it was 2,000 years ago, it'd be hard to prove this actually Jesus. Okay, okay, just imagine hypothetically that there's incontrovertible as an evidence that Jesus Christ has been physically raised from, or, or physically died and didn't come back from the dead, like I could produce his physical body. He said, would you, would you still be a Christian? I was like, no, there, there'd be absolutely no point. I think he was surprised because I think he thought I would say, well, yeah, I think I'd still want to be a Christian because I'd want to be a good person and do nice things. So he was kind of surprised by that. I said, okay, this kind of leads into what I believe is the biggest misunderstanding about Christianity. I think, my opinion is, that the biggest misunderstanding about Christianity is that it's a bunch of people who are trying to do really good things so that they can be good people and be good enough so that God will accept them into heaven. 
which is the absolute, if you read the Bible and you follow Jesus, it's the absolute opposite of what Jesus teaches. Right. It's not, yeah, just, just be a good person, do Preach some good stuff, and you'll get into heaven. It's that we are hopelessly, utterly lost and sinful, and Jesus comes to pay the price for our sin, because we can't earn it. We can't do a whole bunch of good things and then make our way into heaven. We can't go, okay, God, I'm going to stand before you and say I've done enough good works, and you're going to let me in. No, there's no way. There's no way. And this is so important that Jesus died for our sin, because in the resurrection, God's confirming that that sacrifice on our behalf was acceptable. We'll get to that in a second. I'm jumping ahead. So verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. One translation says it's useless or devoid of force, devoid of truth, devoid of success, devoid of results. Kind of like a car without an engine. Like, what's the point of it? What's the point of Christianity if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead? Or if you're a Star Trek fan, it says that it's futile. Does anybody like Star Trek? What do the Borg say? What do the Borg say? Resistance, resistance, is, is, futile. resistance is futile, right? And they're saying you might as well give up now. So Paul is saying to believers, to Christians, Paul, a Christian, is saying to Christians, it's futile. If Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, you might as well give up now. <clears throat> because, because if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, that his death on our behalf was not acceptable to God the Father. And so we're not forgiven for our sins. Think about it this way. I used to work at a furniture store in the shipping department when I lived in Calgary for a bit. And there was an extremely competitive sales staff. I was in shipping, so they were out there selling stuff, and we were just kind of like the, like, um, lead the servants. Yeah, yeah, we didn't get, a couple of them treated us pretty well. Not all of them did. But imagine that an imposter shows up on the sales floor of this really high-end furniture store. Hasn't been sent there by the owner. Hasn't been uh, hired by the owner. Is on the sales floor, starts telling a lot of lies about themselves starts taught it's telling a lot of lies about the product that they're trying to sell. And then at the end of the day, the manager or the owner walks onto the sales floor and is like, who is this? Like, I didn't, I didn't hire you. I didn't send you. You're lying about the products. You're lying about yourself. Get out of my store before I call the police. You wouldn't say, oh, awesome. You're lying about yourself. You're lying about the products. Here, have a raise. So, so God, if he didn't send Jesus, if his sacrifice wasn't acceptable, wouldn't have raised him from the dead. He would not have raised him from the dead. He would have just been like, okay, the guy was a fraud, the guy was a liar, I'll just let him stay dead, and we'll just let that die out, which happened time and time again. There'd be people that would rise up and say, I'm the Messiah, I'm here to save you. And then they die, and their followers would slowly disperse. But something different happened. Something different happened. The resurrection is the seal of God the Father, God the Spirit, on the ministry of Jesus, that is accepted, that, that his sacrifice in our behalf is acceptable that that misunderstanding of Christianity is done away with, right? You can't earn your way to God. It's not as if God says, okay, you're at A, and I'm at Z, and you've got to work really hard to get from A to Z. There's no way. He comes from Z to A with Jesus in the Son of God and pays the price that we couldn't pay, lives the perfect life we couldn't live, dies the death that we deserve for our sin, and then is not just left in the ground, but is resurrected, and that's the seal of God upon his approval that that sacrifice is acceptable to God. Romans 1, 4 tells us that Jesus was shown to be the Son of God. This is Romans chapter 1, verse 4. Jesus was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus the Messiah, our Lord. If Jesus was not resurrected, the believer would not have forgiveness for sins because Jesus would not have been who he said he was. God would not have accepted his sacrifice we would have no peace with God. If, he would, if Jesus was still dead, there's no peace with God. There's no forgiveness for sins. There's no new life in Christ. Paul talks about in Colossians and Romans and Galatians, he talks about salvation as a dying with Christ and then a rising to newness of life with him. But if Jesus is still dead, then how can we rise to newness of life with Jesus? If there is no new life in Christ, if Christ is still dead and buried, there'd be no point. There'd be no point to what we're doing. Again, verse 17, if Christ has not been raised. Your faith is futile. You might as well give up. Your faith is futile and you're still a sin in sin. If Christ hasn't been raised, our faith is without truth. It's without force. It's without result. Paul even says earlier uh, in verse 14, 
He says our preaching is in vain. And then in verse 15, he says, we've even been found to be misrepresenting God. He's saying, if Paul hasn't been raised, or if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, he says, I'm actually lying about God. Which is obviously strikes fear into his heart. But God has accepted Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. Forgiveness is made available to all who will take it. And the experience of new life, being a new creation and having a new beginning in Christ, is given. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And this hope isn't just for today. If you look at verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So why does Paul say that? I mean, it would be all right to go through this life, say we lived 70, 80, maybe 90 years or something like that, and have forgiveness in this life. That would be all right. But if that's it, if we just die and there's nothing after that, then we're living our life trying to please God, trying to live according to the commandments that Jesus has given us, and having that freedom that we find in forgiveness in Christ. But then it just ends, and there's no hope for tomorrow. Paul's saying that we're just going to perish and it's going to be in vain. But because Jesus has been raised from the dead, we see that we can be raised from the dead as well in the future when, when Christ returns. So then death though it's inevitable, is no longer terminal. So death, though it's inevitable, we're all going to die, 100% of us, unless Christ returns before we die. It's inevitable, it's going to happen, but it's not terminal, it's not the end. It's not the end. Uh, theologian Stanley Grenz says that death does mark the end of earthly life, but not the end of personal existence. Our hope is for more than today, and though death will bring an end to this present state of life, it will not be the end. So Jesus' defeat of death and his bodily resurrection will be fully accomplished, will be fully realized in us. In us. So Jesus has defeated death, he's conquered death, and then that conquering, that victory over death is going to be fully applied when we are raised to newness of life. Yes, death is inevitable, but it is not terminal. He is risen. He is risen indeed. So those who have taken hold of, by faith, peace with God through Christ, and participate in this new life of Jesus will spend eternity in the presence of God. But as physical beings, right? We think often when we die, our, our spirits go to be in heaven, which is true, right? So somebody that's passed, that, that, that's gone, that, that's died now, is, is present with Jesus if they're a follower of Christ, if they put their faith in Christ, been saved by him. But that's not the final state. The final state is the return of Christ. All the dead are raised. The judgment seat of God happens. So you're judged before God, and you're definitely not going to be able to do it on your own works, right? But because this, this payment of Christ has been accepted by the Father, he's raised him from the dead, those who have put their faith in Christ say, this free gift of forgiveness, I'm appropriating that for myself. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me. Those people will be resurrected to eternal life, physical life physical, spiritual life in a new heavens and a new earth. Now you might say, not so interested in eternity in a physical body. I'm like, okay, like my hair's starting to fall out and my kids are like, dad, you're still growing. You're just growing this way a bit more instead of that way. But some of you have a lot more serious physical concerns, physical ailments. So you think, what? Why would I want to live for eternity in a physical body? And Paul, Paul addresses that in this chapter too. He talks about how we're going to be raised to this newness of life that we can't imagine. We're not, we're not sure what this resurrection body is going to be like. But it's going to be full of health and full of life. And we're going to be physically with God. Physically. He talks about the difference between, in verses 36 to 38, he talks about the difference between a grain of wheat and a stalk of wheat and how they're different things. I don't know much about wheat. Like, I grew up on the island. Maybe somebody in the prairies can <laughs> give us a lecture on wheat. But I think about the difference if you're looking at a pine tree, the trunk and the needles are all the pine tree. But they're very different. One is full, strong, powerful. The other one falls to the ground and is just kind of like this thing that you, you, you step on with your feet. So we don't know what our full healthful, no more sickness, no more pain, no more dying, no more sorrow, eternal uh, bodies are going to be like. But we do know that God is saying that it's not a spiritual as good, physical as evil. 
there's this full salvation that's coming to us where death will be swallowed up by life. Another amazing part of that, about our hope for tomorrow, this physical hope for tomorrow, is that those who have died in Christ, those who have died believing in Christ with faith in Christ, will be able to hold them again, physically again. Um, Candace announced earlier the death of Sophia Noel, and I remember after after she died the day after Candace uh, went to visit her, and I, I didn't go to that visit because I thought it was like a girl's visit, and then she died the next day, and uh, I got a text from from Wes, and you know I was just just saying hey praying for you I'm so sorry for, for what's happened. And he said, yeah, I said, I'm sorry you never got to meet her. I'm sorry you never got to hold her. This one-month-old child of our friends who we love. And uh, I didn't text this back to him, but I thought, I will. I'll get to hold her physically in the new heavens and the new earth. Will she be a, a, a baby anymore? Will she be an adult? I don't know. We don't know how that's all going to work. But I have hope that there's this physical, eternal life where there's no more sorrow, no more pain, no more tears, no more death. We're going to be able to experience that for those who have died in Christ. Yes, He is risen. He is risen indeed. And though death is inevitable, it is not terminal. It's going to happen, but it is not going to be the end for those who die in Christ. He has overcome death, and so will we. So He's risen indeed. Through Him we have peace with God. Father has said, yep, yeah, you've been raised from the dead because I've accepted your sacrifice on, our, on the behalf of sinful human beings, which is us. He died the death that we couldn't, we, we, we should have died. And that stamp of, of, of approval for that sacrifice as being acceptable to God has been placed on Jesus and raised from the dead. He's overcome death and so will we in the future. Jesus wasn't resurrected from the dead, and he is certainly not living in us by the Holy Spirit. And we are powerless to accomplish the mission of God. Not only is the mission of God uh, pointless and a lie if Jesus hasn't been risen from the dead, Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, but there's certainly no empowering for that. But because Jesus has been raised, he lives in us. The presence of Christ is mediated, is, is, is put into, is placed into, is sort of accomplished in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Because he's alive, Jesus' presence is mediated to us by the Holy Spirit. And I think that's why we can be empowered to have like fearless mission. I struggle with fear all the time. Like I'm like, oh, should I tell my neighbor about Jesus? Should I not tell my neighbor about Jesus? Like, are they gonna think I'm weird? I don't know what to do. And then I remember the empowering, like the things that Jesus went through for me. And sometimes I act right, sometimes I don't. So praise God for his forgiveness. But I think about in 165 A.D., in 250 A.D., in 1300s A.D., in 1527, there was plagues, there was outbreaks, similar to COVID, but a lot more death. And Christians would actually stay and care for the sick when other people fled, because they knew that death wasn't the end for them. They had this living hope, this living empowerment from a living Savior who had been raised from the dead and who was now living in them by the Holy Spirit. We be so bold today? Would we be so bold today? I wonder. Martin Luther, you may know, is the one of the main reformers in, in the reformation of the church. When the bubonic plague came back to Germany in 1527 in Luther's hometown of Wittenberg, it was great, his hometown was greatly affected. In response, he wrote a letter to his friend and to a fellow pastor, and in this letter, Entitled Whether One Should Flee During a Deadly Plague. That's kind of a great letter to get in the mail. Like, imagine you open it up. Whether one should flee during a deadly plague. He says this I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. Then I'll take all the means necessary and the medicine necessary to protect my, myself. I shall avoid places and persons where my presence is not needed in order to not contaminate them or to become contaminated. But if God should wish to take me, he will surely find me. And I have done what he has expected of me, and so I'm not responsible either for my own death or the death of others. If, I, if my neighbor needs me, I shall not avoid place or person, but will go freely as stated above. See, this is such a God-fearing faith. It's neither brash nor foolhardy and does not tempt God. So he's saying, I'm going to follow Jesus, and if I die, I die. So what about you? 
He's wanting to empower you. He's wanting you to be fearless. This resurrection power is for today. It's for right here. It's for right now. Jesus' resurrection has brought about this new age, this new kingdom of God that's here, that's breaking in, that's breaking through. And God commands us to go into all the world and to make disciples, to share about Jesus. And then he ends that in Matthew 28. He ends that by saying, and he will be with us always. And he will be with you always. He is alive. He is the power. He is the source, the resurrected Christ, working through us in power to live the way he lives, to work the way he works, to speak the way he speaks, the fearless power of the mission. So because Jesus is raised from the dead, we can have peace with God. The sacrifice on our behalf has been accepted. The seal of approval is upon Jesus' death and his resurrection. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead, we have a future. Death isn't, isn't the end. It's not the, final, it's not the final say in our lives. We're going to have a physical, embodied future again, those of us who put our faith in Christ, and we'll be able to be again with those who put their faith in Christ. And there's empowering because Jesus has risen. There's empowering today. Now, I want to be very clear. I've talked about the resurrection as an established fact, and I've done absolutely nothing to point toward it being an established fact. And we don't have time for that this morning. But seriously, if you're questioning that, or if you want more resources about that, please come and talk to me, because there is some amazing um, books on it, articles on it, um, even YouTube videos if you look for the right um, people, because like anybody can put anything on the internet, right? And some of it's good, but um, some of it you can kind of save yourself a lot of time if you if you're like the resurrection and then a certain person's name instead of just like just Jesus rise from the dead. You'll have to you'll have to sift through a lot more stuff. It doesn't make it true just because billions of people read believe it. Billions of people can easily be wrong. It doesn't make it true if we believe hard enough. It doesn't make it true if we kind of say, well, it kind of was like this idea that Jesus was sort of like raised spiritually and he lives in our hearts. Paul's saying if he wasn't physically, historically real, like really, really, really a dead person came back to life, then we're actually wasting our time. So please come and talk to me if, if, you, if you want more uh, stuff, more resources to look into that, um, that type of stuff. And Paul actually begins this section in 1 Corinthians 15. He actually, he says to them, hey, these were Jesus' appearances, these are the people that he appeared to, and now reading that, we're like, well, that's nice, you can say you appeared to whoever he wants, this is 2,000 years later, but you've got to remember when this letter was written, it's written to people that would have known some of those people, so it would have been like me saying, hey, Candace was raised from the dead, Bob saw it, uh, PJ saw it, Dana saw it, Eric saw it, you can go and ask them. So that's what Paul's saying, Paul's not just saying, hey, I wrote it, believe it. Paul's saying, these are some people that saw it, go and ask them. So if you're questioning, did Jesus rise from the dead? Can I really believe this? Does this actually happen in reality? It's okay to ask those questions. It's okay to ask those questions. It's okay to search deeper into that. Even if you're a believer or if you're not a believer. A youth um, in our youth group put his faith in Christ. Well, he's a young adult now. He put his faith in Christ last summer. And he'd been coming to youth group for quite a while. And when he first came to youth group, he described himself, he's like, I am a hard atheist, which is like, there's no room for anything spiritual. There's no room for anything supernatural. There's no room for God or spirits or anything like that. I thought, okay, well, you know, welcome to the club. There's lots of youth that come that are in your, your, your boat. Um, and, and over the years, he started to ask these questions. I remember even when he was younger, he had some good questions, and I said, hey, like, do you want to talk about this morning? He said, no. Nah. I don't want to talk to you about that. Like, if I want to look for answers, I know where to find them. Okay. And then, so we started to talk a little bit more over the years. And he said, you know, I think, I think, like, I, I believe now that Jesus was a physical person in history. And I was like, well, that's good, because even, like, the most advanced atheists believe that he was a physical person in history. They just believe different things about him than a Christian would believe. And then he said, um, I think like I'm starting to believe some of the things you're talking about with Jesus, like his teachings and, and who he might be and stuff like that. He said, how do I know like if I'm a Christian or not? And I said, well, it says in Romans 10, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And so he thought about it and he said, nah. He said, I can say that, but he said, I don't believe it in my heart. And then a few weeks later, we were at camp 
and he came to me and he said, man, he said, my life's been transformed. I said, oh yeah, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, since I became a Christian. I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, don't you know there's supposed to be an altar call? You're supposed to come to the front, you gotta put up your hand, and like, we gotta pray for you, and like, you gotta say this, this. Like, I'm, I'm kidding, you don't actually need to do that. He said, no, he said, he said I, I believe now. And I said, well, do you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that God raised him from the dead, and do you confess that with your mouth? He said, yeah. He said, I believe that in my heart now, and I'm different, I'm transformed. There's resurrection power that is available to us. Jesus says that, uh, or the Word of God says that when, when we put our faith in Christ, that the old is gone, the new is come. That we can die with Christ, the old, Christ, the, the, the old person dies with Christ when he's buried, and we're risen to newness of life. Peace with God, the promise in death, and power for mission today. Jesus is raised from the dead. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I'm going to invite uh, Dana and PJ. I think we're going to prep for prepare for communion. Um, that's right, right? Yes. yes. Okay. So we can we can get that ready. I'm going to say a couple things about communion, and then I'm going to pray. So communion uh, is a celebration is a remembrance, it's a solemn remembrance and a celebration of Jesus' death in our place. And you're invited to partake in that if you've said, yes, Jesus' death in my, in, in my place is what I want and I found it acceptable, God has found it acceptable and I've received forgiveness. In 1 Corinthians 15, near the end of it, Paul writes, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? And this ties into communion because Jesus says, or Paul says when he's talking about Jesus in 1 Corinthians 11, this is kind of the classic um, Lord's Supper verses. For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. And I want you to hear this. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes. Because he's risen, because he's raised from the dead, because death no longer has sting and victory, because death now was swallowed up in life, we're waiting for the return of a resurrected Savior. So we do this communion. We participate in the blood and in the body and in remembering Christ until he comes. Christ's body broken, Christ's blood spilled out because he died. But, not only did he die, but we celebrate this until he comes, because he's returned. So, uh, Dana and PJ are going to come around with elements and distribute them, and then you just hold them, just hold them for now, and, and we'll pray together, and then we'll eat them and drink them together. And if you don't feel comfortable, if you're like, yeah, this, this isn't for me, I'm not ready for communion, that's totally fine. Just let it pass by. I'm going to pray. Let's just take a moment to reflect on Jesus' death on our behalf and hold <coughs> now the body and blood of Jesus, his body broken for you, his blood poured out for you, that this is a sign of an acceptable offering that's been made, that because Jesus was raised from the dead, this offering is acceptable. Peace with God is possible. Our faith is no longer in vain, is not futile. There's going to be a future hope for each and every person that puts their faith in Christ. There's going to be a physical resurrection. We're going to be resurrected unto life where death is swallowed up in victory, where death no longer has sting, where death no longer has power. We're going to be able to hold those who have died in Christ physically. I tell you, I'm looking forward to giving Sophia a hug mm -hmm. because I never got to do that while she was alive. So this time is about Jesus. Let's take a moment to reflect. Thank you, Jesus, for your death on our behalf.
there's anybody here today who's who has not put their faith in Christ who says, yeah, I've heard this message before, maybe even time and time again, maybe even year after year, but I've never said, yes, the acceptable sacrifice for my sin was made on the cross. I want to put my faith in, in Jesus now and the work that he has done on my behalf, the perfect life that he lived that I couldn't live, and the death that he died that I deserved. I accept that gift, his life for my life, my life for his life. I invite you to do that now. Just say, Jesus, save me. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. <coughs> do this in remembrance of me. say the same thing about the cup, but just hold on, because before we drink together, I want you to say, until he comes. You know, at a party, we, we say cheers. <laughs> well, this is looking forward to the greatest party that there will ever be, the wedding supper of the Lamb. Revelations talks about every eye, every tribe, every tongue surrounding the throne of the Lamb, bowing down and giving worship and glory and praise in, in, in languages beyond the number that we can comprehend the wedding supper of the Lamb. So this is Christ's blood poured out for you until he comes. Until he comes. Um, I want to give you a chance to respond because I feel like there might be people that want to respond with questions or comments about what we talked about this morning, and then we'll, con we'll conclude with the song in a few minutes. So if anybody has anything to say, now's the time. Uh, and if not, that's fine too. We can just sing and continue to worship Christ. <coughs> Thank you so much.